So there we go. Um, that's Mike Pilavacci, and I'll say Mike Pilavacci's dishwasher. If I, if I had to guess, I think I'd say probably Hot Point. Okay. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> so uh, you didn't know that. That's one of Tim's specialist skills. He yeah. can identify any make of home appliance just from the uh, from the Finnish case that he makes. But yeah, these things happen in uh, you know hashtag lockdown life. Um, trying to record a sermon and get interrupted by uh, the kitchen appliance. Anyway, you can tell it's not a proper sermon because we sat on the conversation chair. Con conversational stools. Yeah. Uh, just to extend that, it's a, this is a bit sad, but it's very true. My um. My dishwasher at home. Do you remember the old Channel 4 news? Dun, 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 bam, that bit. My, I know my dishwasher sound because it goes, dun, 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 that's the sound. Dun, dun, dun. Very, a little bit different, but that's, there you go, anyway. So what, it's true. What, what brand is that, sorry? That is actually, <laughs> that's Hot Point as well. Hot Point as well, maybe they're yeah. all Hot Point. Yeah, they're, I think they're all Hot Point. So, um, Soz. I, I, gave, I, I gave Tim uh, questions um, in, a, in advance. We hadn't compared answers. Um, I would have told him to cut that bit out if we had prepared beforehand. <laughs> but, but anyway, this will be a genuine, genuine conversation. Um, yeah, we, we don't know what, uh, what each other is going to say. But um, in that, that video, Mike talks about fruitfulness in the land of suffering based on the name that he gave uh, uh, Joseph gave to one of his sons, Ephraim. Um, and two principles, I think, in particular stood out. One is learning humility, and the other is pursuing faithfulness or obedience. So I think those, those are two things we're going to major on in terms of how we might be able to apply um, that passage of Scripture, just that one verse really from Genesis, to our lives and our situation that we're going through right now. So the first question uh, was, how has God been teaching you humility in lockdown? Well, <clears throat> I think... As I was thinking through these questions, I've been mulling, mulling over them for the last few days, and I, they're quite difficult, really, some of them. But um, with this one particularly, I, I think probably I'm one of these people that flies into a difficulty or into a trouble, and I go into, like, fix-it mode. So it's like, okay, well, we're, you know, a year ago uh, when the pandemic kind of kicked off, it was like, right, uh, we've got to... We're going to have to go online. We've got to do this. We've got to fix that. We've got to update the website. We've got to change this. We've got to, you know, and I just went, absolutely went into fix-it mode. Um, and that went quite well for a little while. Um, and, then, and then I think, and especially that the Lord has been teaching me recently, is actually, do you know, um, there are some things you can't fix. Um, and actually, it's quite a humbling position to be in when you get to a point and say, do you know what? even through my best endeavors, even though I've put all my strength, all my, like, as much as I can at this, I'm still feeling exhausted, I'm still feeling run down, I'm still feeling low, and I can't do it, Lord. Um, and I think that's just quite, for me, that's been quite a humbling position. And now, like, I think bizarrely, in a, having gone through the process of kind of coming before Lord and, and saying, Father, I'm sorry that I've tried, to, that I try to do so much stuff by my own strength, but I think especially... At the start of lockdown, it was like, okay, well, I, you know, we can do this. We can fix this for ourselves. We can put enough structures around us. We can Zoom enough people. We can, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and I think for me, just this, this realization of actually, Tim, there's like, just, just stop doing and just be with God, be with him. And I think for me, that was just quite a, that was quite a humbling uh, position to be in and being like, it's not you this time, just rest, trust in God. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's really true. I think probably lots of people can associate with that. One thing I meant to say was you'll, um, hopefully you'll see the questions have come up on the screen. Um, we're doing that so maybe you can take a note of them while we're talking um, and have a think through them uh, for yourselves. Um, so I think... I, my, my thoughts on, on this question, similar to yours, I was listening to a podcast um, with a guy called John Tyson, who's a really interesting person to listen to. He's a pastor in, in a church in New York City, in Manhattan, right in the middle of New York. Um, so similarly, crazy time for them over the last year um, in many ways. And he was reflecting back on 2020 
And his, his thought was, it's been a terrible year externally, but a great year internally. And I'm not sure that I can go quite that far, but what he was saying is his prayer life used to be all about um, uh, just intercessory prayer, just going um, like prayer that sounded like warfare. It was like, come on God, um, let's have breakthrough, let's see you move, let, we need this situation to change and, and all this. And instead his prayer has just been, I can't do this, I can't, I can't carry these burdens anymore. Only you can, you can take them, God. Like I'm, I'm through with thinking I can do it all. Um, and and what it uh, what it reminds I mean that that sort of I can I can really uh, empathise with and uh, the verse that came to mind was you know it's one Peter five casting all your burdens onto Jesus for He cares for you and what I didn't realise until I looked up that verse is it actually starts um, humble yourself. Humble yourself, I think, before the Lord or under God's hand. Humble yourself, casting your burdens onto him for he cares for you. So there's this thing of relinquishing your cares, um, giving them, not holding on to them, but giving them to him um, uh, and uh, allowing him to carry the things that we're not meant to carry. Um, I don't know if I've said this before, like I've only been preaching for kind of three years, but I always fe already feel like I've run out of, of anecdotes. But um, when I was at university, I was helping to organize um, like a week, classic weekend away for the Christian Union, our Christian Union and some of the other colleges, so probably 80 or so, 80, 200 uh, students there. It's a bit of a stress like for an 18-year-old to try to do that. Um, and I was properly stressing out about it. And then we got, got there to this um, farm like on the outskirts of Oxford and um, all dark in November and, and they're trying to get into this place and there was problems with the accommodation. And one of the other CU leaders was just like, what you've got to remember is there's a big guard, but there's only a little mark. And that, that little phrase has, has stayed with me, like trying to keep those things in perspective when, when you go around trying to fix everything. And I, I think this, he said at one point that when things are going great, um, this is Mike, you know, when things are going great, it's easy to rely on yourself. Um, and then when everything's stripped away, we, the only thing we can do is really rely um, on God. Um, in not so many words maybe but uh and i just think that's that's so true that um i think for many of us you know so much of what we would call normal has been stripped away um and although i think we did we did so well uh, for a little while at kind of pretending like things were okay and now a year on i think a lot of us have said well <laughs> got to a point where we say lord um yeah we we just we're just going to focus on you and and trust that you'll figure the rest out for because we our, our little human brains can't do it anymore i don't think that's exactly right we're just not not designed to uh, to hold it all ourselves um so thinking about obedience now um mike said about how joseph even though he was wrongfully imprisoned for 13 years could have just felt sorry for himself but instead he looked to obedience. Um, is this a temptation that you've experienced to, in times like these, feel sorry for yourself rather than pressing into obedience to God? Yeah, I think, like, I think unfortunately, it's part of our sinful nature is probably to think of ourselves first. And, um, and I think, you know, when I was thinking about this question, the the first thing that kind of came to my mind was, um, you know, we seem to make decisions based on how we feel. Um, and again, I don't want to knock people's kind of self-care because I think that's really important. You know, I'm not saying like, you know, if you're feeling like you can't do something, then, then and it's for your mental health and stuff, then obviously that's the right decision. But I think there is a, there is sometimes that, something in us that kind of, uses that as a bit of a scapegoat for like oh well 
it's because I, I can't be bothered and actually what I want is, is X, Y, Z. I'd, I'd rather not go on Zoom or I'd rather not do this and I'd rather, you know, and, and I think it's when, it's when we start, I think when we start making decisions like that again, again and again, it's not too long before we notice that that kind of perspective in our lives is taken a root and actually, um, and you know, and so I think in terms of obedience in, in the little things, um, the, the kind of the decisions that we make that aren't particularly, maybe not be particularly spiritual, but as followers of Jesus as part of the church family to say, actually, I, you know, I'm committed here and I'll, you know, and therefore X, Y, Z, or, or I'll choose to do it, even though I think maybe I can't be bothered and I'd rather eat a pizza, watch Netflix, watch steam trains, or I don't do that that much, but I do it a little bit. I, I, I love that you, uh, Come, come back to pizza and steam trains every time. In this I live time, a simple so. life, Mark. I live a very simple life. No, you know what you like. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I was, I was reading um, this, just in my Bible readings for this week, Matthew 13 is parable of the sower, which lots of people will be, uh, will be familiar with. And of the, of the four soils um, where the seed lands, one of them that it talks about is um, the seed falls and uh, it, it sort of takes root a bit but um, then thorns grow up and choke it. And when Jesus explain, explains what that parable means, he describes the thorns as um, a, a sort of on one side it is the... Um, the deceitfulness of the false promises that wealth um, tempts us with. On the other side, it's the anxieties and cares of the world. So two like worldly concerns that um, in the limited soil of our lives, we can either allow God's word to spring up and that to produce a crop, or these are the worldly concerns can um, choke it. So I guess a thorn must be a sort of stronger, more dominant plant that, that grows up and doesn't allow enough space for other plants to grow up around it. Um, and yeah, it was like we've, got, we've all got limited capacity. We, we can't do everything, as we've just been saying. Um, so what are the things that we're going to make space for in our lives? And if the thing that I'm making space for is either comfort on one side or uh, a sort of overly anxious care about everything that's going on. Like there's, there's so much that's going on in the world and you know, you can turn on the news and there's an impeachment trial and there's you know, an anti-democracy protest and there's always climate things going on and there's um, the vaccination program and all these things and they can just occupy our headspace. And I think um, I've definitely find, found that I've dominated my thoughts on those and not allowed myself to uh, just absorb God's word and let that take root um, and, and the concerns and the cares have been the things that I've wanted to major on and not what God might be saying about those things instead yeah and I, I suppose as you were as you were speaking then I was thinking about kind of entering into obedience but for self gain and, mm -hmm. and the effect that that can have and we're not in your kind of feeling sorry for yourself, but like, okay, well, uh, I'll do those obedience things. And, and I do think, obviously, there's a case for um, getting, I suppose, like we saw with uh, Reese's testimony uh, last week, you know, getting a few practical things in place, being obedient to a few practical things can lead to spiritual breakthrough. But I think we have to be, we have to be careful when we, when we basically um, say, okay, well, Lord, I'll be obedient just so that I can, I can gain from it, not for, you know, it, as worship to you. As, um, and I, I think <laughs> this is a bit tenuous, this uh, anecdote, but Kirsty and I took the opportunity to watch The Dig um, on, uh, on Netflix uh, this, this week, and it's a really good film. We really enjoyed it. Um, it's about the Suffolk Who, um, which is when they unearth a boat, uh, a, a Saxon boat, 
um, which would probably be about the same age as the base of that font, um, you wouldn't believe, uh, and it's just there. But um, the, they were deciding which mound they were going to dig over, what were they going to do, uh, and, and the, the, um, the, the guy, I've forgotten his name, uh, Basil, um, he, Basil Brown, I think, he's a, an excavator and a, an archaeologist, um, and, he, and he goes and he says to, um, I think Mrs. Pretty, Petty, uh, let's, if we dig this mound, the, the, the robbers would have already been in here, and they would have... Um, they would have taken all of, the, all of the riches, all of the treasure, so let's not dig this mound, let's dig over here. Um, it was only then later on that they discovered that actually the, the, the robbers didn't quite understand the layout of the land and therefore they haven't dug deep enough. And I think it kind of, when we enter into things uh, for, for means of our own gain, I think ultimately we lose out. But Billy, um, but Basil, he he understood that archaeology was a, and that our lives were part of a bigger, grander story of 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 the world and of existence, um, and that and so he entered in on that mindset that he wasn't going in for his gain, but he was going in um, to to uncover um, the story to to help it people to learn from it, help people to grow and to place it in in history, um, and so I think just that thing of if we go into when we're going into something for our for our gain, I think ultimately we'll we might just miss the mark slightly, and I think that's that's important. That's true. Um, so then, faithfulness in small things, the gift of plodding, I think yeah. is what Mike called it. Um, what opportunities do you see for us as a church in this season to demonstrate faithfulness in small things? Well, I. I think on top of all the things that Mike obviously mentioned, um, you know, it's, we can send that encouraging text message um, without expecting a response and we can put things on a, a neighbor's doorstep or cook a meal for someone or send a card or remember someone's birth, whatever it might be. Um, I think those are really good ways. But as I was thinking about this, um, the Lord, one thing the Lord reminded me of was, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago I wrote in the, in the Friday at Five about how the Lord was reminding us that we're the body and that we each have a part to play in this church family. And I think, for me, there's something in remaining faithful to the Lord it, 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 during this time um, is actually remembering to be faithful to who he's made us to be, who he's called us to be. And you might say, well, that's not a small thing, Tim. Okay, okay, it's maybe not a small thing. But I think as a body, we rely on one another um, for, for the gifts that God's put in each of us to encourage one another, to help grow and mature one another. And if we, if we kind of feel sorry for ourselves and don't remain faithful to the person that God has made us to be, um, then, then ultimately, um, you know, as a church, we're going to be weaker. And, and I think we, as individuals, uh, will, it'll only lead off down the kind of the wider path um, and, and away from, from God. Yeah, Again, it's coming back to that thing of um, humility. It's like no one is competent and capable to do everything. Um, so, yeah, so there may be a specific thing to which you feel a passion or you feel like you've been particularly shaped. And wholehearted pursuit of that does seem to be a real part of what God, God plans. I mean, we're a, we're a church. We're not... A, a group of um, just individuals occupying our own individual space. The idea is that we, uh, that we work together um, and it's through our shared giftings that God's uh, kingdom, in fact, that Jesus is seen. And I, I, I think, you know, for some people it might be that you have the gift of hospitality um, and I'm sure that most of you have found a way to continue to be hospitable in in the midst of coronavirus and, and you know, whatever it might be, um, I think what my challenge to you would be is if, if pre-lockdown you're aware of God's gifting and the kind of purpose for your life um, and maybe you think about that now and you go, actually, there's, I'm not expressing that in any way now, then my challenge to, to you would be to, to kind of to come before the Lord and say, Lord, like how, how can I use who you've made me to be? How can I use this gifting even in 
this place that we find ourselves now. Mm. The, um, that podcast I was listening to, to um, obviously it talks like a lot about the US election and it, it made me think about the funny sort of climate they have in America with uh, politicians and presidential candidates, that they always have to claim to be Christian and casting no aspersions on any of the candidates uh, faith or otherwise, uh, but it seems like a prerequisite. You've got to say, you know, God bless America and all those things. And he, I was sort of thinking, why, why, is, why do candidates never stand on, on a platform on, a, on uh, like their plan for the nation as being love your neighbour? It's like, that if you're going to claim to be Christian, then surely that would be the most basic of all uh, like the, the good plans for, for, the, for the country. And, um, and then, then obviously if you're faced with the question of who is, who is my neighbour, then, then Jesus answers that for us. And essentially our neighbour is the person who normally we'd cross the road to avoid. And I get that that's everyone at the moment <laughs> because we have to do that weird sort of zigzag walk yeah. across. That's uh, difficult with a pram, I'll tell you that much. And you'd be <laughs> amazed. Like, I, I obviously... That's an aside. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> love, love your neighbour by crossing out the way for them if they have a pram or push chair. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and I do wonder whether this is a call on the, on the church as well, maybe even our church specifically, but just the church in, in general. It's like, when did love your neighbour stop being the agenda? Yeah, that's so good. Um, and, and who is your neighbour? Who's in front of you? Who, who is near to you? Who, who are those people that, like, however you've been called to serve, you can serve them? Um, yeah, and I, I loved what Mike said about, you know, feeding the homeless without having to write a press release about it. It's like that, that I don't know, that got to me a bit. I thought, oh, yeah. It's like, I would think that I deserve a reward if... I do something good purely for the benefit of other people. And I think we, we, if we're not careful, we kind of put it down to like evangelism. It's good that non-Christians know that we do good things because it might make them want to be good and come and, and follow Jesus. And it's a, that's a false truth, I think, isn't it? That, you know, uh, if we, you know, if we do, if we, if we're seen to be doing, doing good stuff, then, then maybe more people will come to know the Lord. Yeah, and, and we, yeah love those who will, uh, even those who will ultimately reject us or reject, reject Jesus. And I know there's discernment and we look for the person of peace, but, um, but Jesus came and, and showed grace to lots of people and they didn't all follow him. I realise this is a bit like sending out a press release now, but um, we, we, we offered to make a meal for a family over the road and hopefully they're not watching this and they won't watch this back. But, um, they, at first, so I could, well, I say we, Kirsty offered, uh, and, uh, and she was absolutely, like, gobsmacked that anyone would ever offer, like, we, we don't really know them, we, you know, they're neighbours that, um, they have young children and they go to the same nursery, and so Kirsty got chatting, and Kirsty offered to make them a meal, quite out of the blue, and she was absolutely gobsmacked. She messaged her friend, and um, her friend said to her, absolutely, you must accept it, this is how community is built. Um, and so she messaged and said yes, and Kirsty made them a, a meal and dropped it round. And you should, like, just the, the response, the thanks, the, they said, like, it was the first night in, in so long that the children were in bed on time, and her and her husband had a nice eat, like, were able to sit down and have some time together. Um, and I think it's, the, it's, you know, it's in little things like that where we don't expect anything in return, and... Um, and it really blessed that family. And it wasn't particularly spiritual. There was no, like, we didn't slip in a little card being like, you know, do you know Jesus? Um, <laughs> and things like that. But, yeah, no, so I think it, the, there's opportunities to do, to do little things like that um, at the moment, especially. And I think we'd just be amazed um, how grateful and how surprised people would be by just that level of kindness in this world at the moment. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so final question then. Um, and this is basically any, any other business, any, yeah. other, um, any other ways that, um, as you've reflected on this, this time, our land of suffering, that you've seen fruitfulness blossom and emerge? Yeah, this was a hard question for me, because I think, 
What's, I'll start with the, I suppose I'll start with the difficult and then bounce onto the, uh, the so I think lockdown has been really difficult for, for some people's faith. Um, and it's been really sad to see friends of ours, members of our church that um, because there's not that regular pattern of worship and stuff, and maybe because people haven't been keeping in touch as well, that they've kind of um, sort of just disappeared off into the fringes a bit and, and maybe their faith is, is struggling and they're, they're kind of um, sw- sort of swaying away from the Lord. And I think that's been really difficult to see and there's a number of people that, um, that I'm aware of and, and pray for. Um, and I think, on the, but on the flip side of that, um, there have been some people in lockdown and during the pandemic who have absolutely flourished and, and th- th- are thriving in their faith and they're, they're you know, deepening in their uh, spirituality and in their understanding of God and, and pressing into good practices. And, and so I think the reason this question is difficult for me is because I think it, it seemed a bit make or break, this, this pandemic, for some people. It, it, it seemed to give some people the, the, the umph to, to say, actually, I need to get some disciplines in place. I need to, like, you know, practice this, this do these things. Um, to remain a good re- in a good relationship with the Lord, whereas it's been difficult to see others who maybe haven't been it, like have gone in the opposite direction. Um, so I think there's kind of it's been really really exciting to be chatting with people and and pressing into the spiritual gifts as we've talked about many times before. And um, and you know and I'm excited for the time when when we do finally get to come back together because you know I think we're going to see a church family that have been transformed. In, in the midst of, of this hardship and in the midst of lockdown. And, and I don't think we'll ever be the same again. Mm. Um, yeah, the things that I was thinking were really similar. Um, um, so at the start of the year, I read through the book of Joshua. Um, one of the things about Joshua um, is that it, it tells the story of sort of Israel claiming the land that God had promised to them. And you think, why, why is it important? Why is it important to have a place? Is it just like, so God can promise something and fulfill it and sort of demonstrate that he's sovereign? But I think because there's something core about how God relates to us and how we, re- we relate to other, each other that is physical, and occupies a space and is embodied. Um, And we see that, I guess, in Eden. Um, We see that that's the destination of where the whole story is going in this um, recreated world in which God is present and we are with him. Um, That we're not headed for uh, a sort of disembodied existence floating around in a cloud somewhere. Um, And the God's Although that that does sound fun. Floating around, though, floating around in a cloud somewhere. Does it though, no, really? Okay. No, for, for no five, steam trains, no, no pizza if you're not an embodied person, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> but there will be in the new creation both of those things. Um, so, yeah, God, God's the incarnate God. God comes in the person of Jesus. He, he, he takes on flesh so he can be physically present on the earth. And, um, and so Joshua leads Israel into uh, the land, um, into Canaan. And I think like, it is important that we're together as people. It's important that we have a space, a sacred space that, where we can gather, um, that we've done our best in these times, but like this virtual remote stuff, um, like connection via the screen is the best we can do at the moment, but we're meant to be connected with people together and I feel um, really fortunate that I've been able to be here often on a Sunday because of being in the band or being involved at at the front Um, uh, but those times have been so rare and yet they're so meaningful for us as a church and I think it's not purely a tradition it is a part of how God has shaped us to be a community and that's to be together in a place. And so, yeah, what that, that concept, I think, 
is something that God's been teaching me and teaching me through the absence of it um, uh, as, as best as we can to have uh, Zoom connect groups and all those things that we pursue with in obedience but it's, uh, it's hard. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's a, I think, a fasting that we've been going through from that time of connection that's been longer than a 40-day fast that's been, been stretching on. But um, hopefully, as you say, it will bring us back together at some point before the end of this year, let's hope, that is um, renewed, that is more meaningful, that is more um, just... Just we feel the deeper sense of relationship with one another at the end of it. Um, I am so not concerned, but I, I get the impression that maybe when we, um, when we do meet together again, our, our services might become a bit sort of um, more Pentecostal in length. You know, we will arrive, <laughs> we'll start at 9 a.m. and we won't be done till 4 o'clock in the afternoon and there'll definitely be one meal involved, uh, <laughs> if not a couple. You know, I, I, maybe we'll turn into, we'll never want to leave each other ever again. No, it's, it sounds like an, uh, a sort of act two, act three church, doesn't it? Isn't that the goal? That's, that's the dream. That's the dream, yeah. Bring your sleeping bag. No, um, that's so good. I think, um, yeah. No, well, thank you. Thank you for um, preparing those thoughts. Thank you for, uh, for coming, willing, willing to share. I really thank appreciate you. it. Um, as I say, those, uh, those comments were on the screen. Hopefully you've noted them down. Hopefully you can have a think of them for yourself. Um, if you enjoyed that little thought for the day style video from Mike Pilavacci, Soul Survivors YouTube channel, do them once a week. I think it's on a Wednesday. Just subscribe to their channel. I've watched them throughout the last year and they've been super helpful to have during the week as a bit of extra teaching input into my life. Um, so I will uh, pray for us now um, and then after we close there's a Zoom chat where we can join together not in person but again best we can do for now but let's, let's pray as we close Father God we thank you for this morning we thank you that you've been with us we thank you that you were with Joseph in his low place in the desert, uh, in prison, through the wilderness, through those times of separation and aloneness, through that time where there was no community. Thank you that he showed obedience as a pattern for what we can follow, knowing that um, you're still noticing us, you're still using all those little acts of faithfulness to you to grow our faith in you and to demonstrate who you are to a world that's desperate to know real love and real truth. Be with us now as we go into the rest of our weeks. Guide our lives. May your hand of protection be over us to all those who are still really struggling in this time, to those whom we love. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.